Uh, dear colleagues, I am grateful that I was given the opportunity to represent the Armenian patristic tradition and heritage within this video series, Contribution of Patristic Studies to the Understanding of the Spiritual Traditions of Humanity. And I want to thank International Association of Patristic Studies and Patricia Siner for this kind su suggestion. Since uh, the topic is quite broad, I thought of inviting a few specialists to, to, uh, to represent one area of this uh, broad topic along with their research. That is why our meeting will not be a dialogue, but rather a lively conversation. And we hope you will like it and will find some interesting new facts for you. We will represent two videos in which we'll treat uh, the topic in chronological order. And I will introduce uh, my colleagues during the conversation. In the first hour of the patristic course, I am oft being asked which church fathers we are going to study. Why are we studying Greek, Syriac, or Coptic fathers, or even more? If we are studying non-Armenian fathers, do the students of other confessions study Armenian church fathers during their patristic course? I think this is a situation which many of my colleagues are familiar with or came across. I would like to begin our conversation with, uh, with an information which is probably little known to our audience. That is, the Armenian church has a list of 12 general fathers who are called Vartapets, the most uh, accepted translation teachers or doctors. In this list are included Herophius, the Thismuthid or of Athens, Sylvester the, the First, Dionysius the Areopagite, Athanasius of Alexandria, Cyril of Jerusalem, Ephraim the Syrian, Basil of Caesarea, Gregory Nazianzen, Gregory of Nyssa, John Chrysostomus, Epiphanius of Salamis, Cyril of Alexandria. Four of them, Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, Basil and Gregory Nazianzen, are the topmost or supreme vertapets. For the first sight, a very logical names are gathered side by side, but from the other side, the inclusion of the names of Herophius and Sylvester, partly also the Dionysius, the Areopagite, might astonish someone. Of course, the question arises when these names were put together and with what intention. The hierarchic degree of Vartapet has a very remarkable development in the Armenian church. Connected with our today's topic, we can say that not only the 12 mentioned church fathers, they are the title, and not only they were translated into Armenian and met a reception in the Armenian milieu. Here we came to our main topic, to the Armenian translated literature. Armenian language represents an independent branch in the Indo-European language family. The development of written Armenian is divided into three stages, ancient, middle, and modern, Eastern and Western Armenian. The Armenian alphabet was founded in 300, uh, 405 AD by the Christian monk and theologian Mesrop Mashtots. This date marks the beginning of a new era in the Armenian culture. Soon after the invention of the Armenian alphabet, still before the indigenous Armenian writings were put down, different works of Syriac and Byzantine literature were rendered into Armenian. The first translation is the translation of the Bible, which was completed in the 430s. It is depicted in the technical literature as the queen of the translations. Then follow the translations, which cover very different fields, philosophy, uh, theology, history, philology, natural sciences. It was not only pure translation in any form, reader-oriented or text-oriented, but also adaptation of the Armenian language to transmit Syriac, Greek, and later Latin and other languages. The value of classical Armenian translations is immense. This is obvious, obvious especially in the cases where the originals Greek and Syriac works are not preserved and Armenian texts are the only witnesses of those writings. Here are to be mentioned the Chronicon by Eusebius of Caesarea, the demonstration of the apostolic teaching by Ironias, 
and numerous translations were done from Armenian into European languages after discovering of this treatise. The refutation of the articles of the Council of Chalcedon by Timotheus Elorus, some treatises by Philo of Alexandria, some commentaries by Hesychius of Jerusalem, John Chrysostom, Eusebius of Emesa, Ephraim the Syrian, etc. Professor Shirinyan, uh, you are studying the classical Armenian translations for many years. Surely you want to amend some more information here. Professor Shinyan is a Byzantinist and the head of the Department for Research of the Armenian Texts of the 5th to 14th centuries at the Mesrop Mashtots Matenadaran Research Institute of Ancient Manuscripts in Yerevan, Armenia. Please, Professor. Thank you, Anaid, uh, for representing me. But I, I just want to add that yes. actually I am uh, dealing on the border of Armenian and Byzantine studies, so more Armenian studies and more translation from Greek in Armenian. And if I may interfere to say about two of these names that you uh, mentioned, um, as a stellas of Armenian church, it's not occasionally, it's not uh, by occasion, but they uh, choose it delib deliberately because, for example, uh, Pope Sylvester has a very, very rich tradition in Armenia uh, literature because of the famous trip of the uh, King Tiridates and uh, Gregory the Illuminator to the Rome. But this is another topic, so let me just speak about uh, patristics in Armenia and it, in, in its reception in this millennium. First of all, we shall uh, speak about some peculiarities of, as translations that today exists only in Armenian. Uh, Anahit already brought the examples and I am not going to repeat her, but I want to uh, speak about uh, particularly about isagogical prolegomenas, which are uh, exist in Armenian and which are not so widespread in uh, Greek text, meaning that perhaps, uh, not perhaps, but of course they were in the Greek, uh, because we know that in, for example, um, fifth century, Adrianus or Hadrianus, the monk, has such a, let's say, manual or textbook, which called Introduction to Holy Scripture, Esagoge Estasteias Graphas, and where he used actually perhaps for the first time the word Esagoge to designate rhetorical, archaeological, geographical, historical, and other matters which might be helpful in the Bible exegesis. Uh, further, we know that. Uh, Two other authors use uh, isagogical uh, textbooks, and we know that it was um, Athanasius and John Chrysostomus. But in Armenian, we have a, a full textbook of a collection which is called uh, by provisional name the Book of Causes and which is still unpublished, unfortunately, and uh, the, uh, which has actually uh, a more longer title, which reads the causes of wide and subtle writings taken from the works of the Holy Fathers and Vartapets. Uh, the Vartapets here, as Anna had said, is doctors of theology, gather it together and provide it by the great Rabunapet Grigor, the son of Abbas. So this unpublished handbook 
is the introduction to the Bible, uh, which is the Isagogical Manual, composed in the 13th centuries in Armenia by the abbot of Sanain Monastery, Grigor, the son of Abbas. Uh, what is interesting here that in this uh, manual, it, the schema isagogicum, so-called schema isagogicum, is used, which is actually a um, schema used by Neoplatonics. And uh, experts think that this schema was used only but by Oregon and then Crocus. But the this Armenian manual shows that uh, all mainly all Armenian, uh, not Armenian, but church fathers use this schema uh, because we have translations of these church fathers preserved in Armenia. And many of them, as I said, let me repeat once again, are preserved only in Armenia. Okay, but this is very uh, uh, wide topic to discuss here. Yeah? I just wanted to give this information. Anahit, you should unmute. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, maybe we come again back to, to the book of causes to say some more uh, sentences about this amazing collection. But uh, in your uh, speech, you have, um, um, you have mentioned many terms that are connected with biblical studies. I will suggest here referring to the Armenian translated exegetical literature. And uh, I will quote Professor Shirinyan who uh, values commentaries as the most important factors of the medieval thought development. Another scholar says, I quote, like other branches of Armenian literature, Armenian commentaries took their start from the series of translations made from Greek and Syriac in the fifth and sixth centuries by senior and junior translators, unquote. The commentaries of John Chrysostom Ephraim the Syrian, um, Cyril of Alexandria, etc., were translated into Armenian and are an important part of the Armenian literature. It is curious to see which exegetical method the Armenian authors follow or whether it is only one. I will represent here some point of views. Um, Pailak Antapian writes, in the election of the exegetical method uh, the Armenian commentators positioned themselves uh, comparatively more liberal, moved more unhindered. They belonged to the group of Christian commentators which applied both mainly both main methods equally. Nevertheless, in our opinion, the scrupulous study of their works shows that the literary method, the exegetical and methodological principles of the Antiochian school were preferred Thus, the application of the allegorical method was reduced comparatively as the Ephraim, uh, the Syrian, the great Cappadocians and others did." Unquote. Another scholar, Brezhner Sisyan, mentions that the preference of the Armenians for the Antiochian theology was explained by the fact that the leading figures of the school were staunch upholders of the faith of Nicaea. Um, but, unquote, but concerning the indigenous commentaries, the scholar writes, it adopted elements of interpretation from various traditions of exegesis, linking them together, creating what Pailak and Tapian calls chain commentary. In these commentaries, we find passages from Antiochian and Alexandrian biblical scholars widely quoted, unquote. There is still no una voce, a unison in this discussion. And besides, the issue with the exe exegetical uh, schools is an active discussion also for the original languages and the native literatures can be regarded as an additional help. One of the earliest translation, translated texts are the ecclesiastical canons. 
and I would like here to ask uh, Dr. Narine Vartanian to speak about the ecclesiastical canonic literature. Narine Vartanian is working since many years uh, on the editions of the Armenian Book of Canons. Please, Narine. Thank you, Anahi. In the fifth century, due to intensive translation movement, short after the invention of the Armenian alphabet, also the canonical writings of the church fathers were translated into Armenian. Subsequently, these works or their edited versions were included into the Armenian canonical collection. Like the canonical collections of other Christian churches, the Armenian one was formed in stages. Being composed in the fifth century, the Armenian Book of Canons has been continually edited and gradually expanded during many centuries, including new canonic groups, translated or original, and has reached us in numerous editions, similar or significantly different from each other in structure and content. The best known or most studied of these editions is the one made by Catholicos Hovanot Netsi, the philosopher, in the 8th century, conventionally named Armenian Book of Canons. Up to the 17th century, this collection, initially containing 24 canonic groups, had been redited, corrected, and expanded many times, thus increasing up to 60 canonic groups in manuscript edition known as A, or 81 canonic groups in manuscript edition known as B. Since its compilation, the Armenian Book of Canons has been used by the Armenian Apostolic Church as a sum of official documents regulating spiritual, ecclesiastical, ritual, dogmatic, economic, social, and various other issues. Yeah, maybe I will interrupt here. Which names of the ecclesiastical writers are circulating in the Armenian Book of Canons? Armenian canonical collections include canonic groups authored by, attributed to Clement of Rome, Athanasius of Alexandria, Basil of Caesarea, Ephraim the Syrian, Cyril of Alexandria, Epiphanius of Salamis or Cyprus, Gregory the Nazianzen, Macarius of Jerusalem, Dionysus the Aeropagite, Saint John Chrysostom, Italian. Only part of these canonic groups is thoroughly studied. The study showed that among these canonical writings attributed to church fathers and included into the Armenian canonical collections, one could mention a few types of canonic groups. First, Pure translation of authentic and not authentic writings, as those of the letter of Macarius of Jerusalem or the second apostolic canons by Clement of Rome. Second, canonic groups which are extracted or redacted versions of the church father's writings. For example, 88 canons attributed to Athanasius, 15 of them uh, were translated from the canonical writing by his disciple. Timothy of Alexandria, and the others were probably added by Armenian editors. Or the canons of Basil entitled the Basil's Canons uh, to Ampilochius, 51 chapters. They are an abridgment of his canonical letters, featured in the Greek collections in 92 chapters. And the third pseudepigraphical writing that had been written later in the Armenian environment and attributed to distinguished fathers to raise their value and legality. Like for instance, canonic groups included to the Book of Canons in the 10th, 17th centuries and attributed to Gregory the Nazianzen, St. John Chrysostom, Basil of Caesarea, Epiphanius of Salamis, Italian. We should note that the authenticity of some uh, other kind of canons attributed to Basil of Caesarea were dubbed even by the famous 20th, 12th century Armenian author, Mohitar Ghosh, in his law code. Therefore, the canonic groups authored by attributed to the church uh, fathers were included both in the Armenian canonical collections of the fifth century and into numerous editions of it up to the 17th century. Oh, thank, thank you. you. 
Yeah, we see that uh, here we still have many unclarified issues and the researchers are working on the Armenian ecclesiastical canons and their compilation, the book of canons in Armenian Kananagir Kayots. And we can be sure many fascinating results still lie ahead. Our next topic is also very challenging. We will speak a little about the pseudepigraphical literature. I would like to ask Dr. Armine Melkonian, whose research focuses on medieval Armenian theological and philosophical treatises and commentaries, to report about one of her latest studies, which is also of patristic interest. Armine has been working at the, at, uh, the Matenaderan Institute of Ancient Manuscripts. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Florence as a member of European Research Council project Armen. So please, Armine. Um, Anahi, thank you very much for having me in this uh, interesting meeting and giving me an opportunity to present one of the literary pieces I'm currently studying. So when I was working on the Armenian manuscripts containing works by the 5th, 6th century Armenian Neoplatonist philosopher David the Invincible, I noticed a pattern that uh, David's major work, Definitions of Philosophy, is always followed uh, by a short composition without a separate title, uh, the beginning of which is Every Evil is Punishable, in Armenian, Amenain Chartangeli. It represents syllogisms uh, on good and evil aiming at refutation of the uh, dualistic cosmology. In fact, this is the pseudo-Gregory of Nisa syllogism against the Manichaeans, which in the Greek tradition has been attributed uh, to Didymus the Blind as well. Moreover, this text is also known under the name of the 6th century author John the Caesarea, the grammarian, known for his apology of the Council of Chalcedon. As for the Armenian tradition, it is attributed to David the Invincible philosopher, who is one of the most outstanding figures in the Armenian uh, intellectual history. And uh, it should be marked that uh, the Armenian tradition ascribes to David many philosophical and theological writings, but this one uh, is important that it is not only uh, ascribed to David, but inserted just after his um, major work in the manuscript and in the commentary literature, it has been considered as, uh, as the last chapter of the definitions of philosophy. And one can assume that due to this contribution and insertment, these pseudepigraphical writings uh, became very popular in the medieval Armenian uh, reality because uh, the definitions of philosophy was taught in the Armenian uh, uh, universities and school as uh, one of the basic philosophical uh, pieces. Oh, let um, me let me interrupt you. Yeah, <laughs> please. I would like to ask here: Do we know when the, this piece uh, was translated into Armenian and attributed to David the Invincible? Yes, that's a good question, and I uh, the. All these extant manuscripts uh, of this text uh, date to the 13th century. If I'm not mistaken, the oldest one was copied in the 1243. Uh, but we have a commentary created in the mid 12th century. Uh, I'm, I'm going to present next, which uh, proves that uh, this text, the Armenian version, was created prior to the 12th century. But one shouldn't exclude that uh, uh, the translation was made even earlier, even in the 6th, 7th centuries, during the um, uh, activity of the Hellenizing school in Armenia. Uh, however, uh, in absence of more literary evidences and manuscripts, it's difficult to to, um, uh, to date the text more precisely. And I would love to add that Dr. Benedetta Contin from the University of Vienna has made a linguistic and textological analysis uh, on this text, comparing the Armenian uh, version with the Greek uh, uh, texts 
uh, published under the name of Gregory of Nisa Didymus the Blind and uh, John the Grammarian, and she supposes that the Armenian text is more likely a re-elaboration of the Didymus' text. This is interesting, but uh, my study focuses on the Armenian manuscript tradition and the uh, commentaries, so let me now briefly turn to them. So the first commentary, as I said, was created in the 12th century by Nerses Shnorhali, but Nerses the Graceful, uh, one of the prominent Armenian authors, uh, uh, church figure, also a Catholicos from 1166 to 1173. And it's amazing how he combines uh, the definitions of philosophy and the syllogisms. Um, I will read a small passage from his uh, uh, work. He writes, let's now discuss why the great philosopher wrote this work on good and evil. Thus, he doesn't have any doubts that the author of this work is David, the philosopher. He continues, certain sophists named Pyrrho and those who followed him denied the existence of philosophy, which is a divine gift descended from heaven to people. Uh, it is known that David wrote his uh, uh, definitions of philosophy uh, against the Pyrrhonian uh, skepticism. Uh, Shnorhali continues, there were some who affirmed that evil was uncreated, but the most wicked one wrote that both evil and good act in the people's hearts by the influence of God. That's why our right-minded philosopher had to write on this issue so that people wouldn't think that evil is uncreated or created by the uncreated God. Such a philosophical <laughs> sentence. In the whole commentary, uh, there is no direct mention of Manichaeans. While the author of the next interpretation, 14th, 15th century philosopher, theologian, Arakel Sunetti, from the famous uh, monastery of Datev, uh, reports the following. David wrote uh, it against the Pyrrhonists and against Mani, which is interesting. He writes uh, in Armenian Manikos, uh, who said, he continues, who said that the world has the beginnings. One of them is the uncreated good, that is God, and the other is the uncreated evil. It is difficult to say whether Arakel Sunetti was aware of, of the original title because in the Armenian manuscripts, we do not have any title uh, uh, bearing the name of Manichaeans, but this is an important reference. In conclusion, there are Armenian commentaries by Nerses the Graceful, Arakel Sunetti and Anonymous uh, on the writing by Pseudo Gregory of Nyssa or Didymus the Blind or John the Grammarian in Armenian tradition uh, ascribed to David the Invincible. This is interesting in terms of Armenian interpretations uh, of the works uh, by the church fathers, even pseudo-epigraphical. From the other hand, being written against the Manichaeans, these works and uh, its, its commentaries could be important from the perspective of interreligious religions in the Middle Ages that I'm going to investigate in the near future, I hope. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Armine, uh, for your agreement to share uh, with us the results of your recent research and for mentioning also a few pieces of the Armenian indigenous literature. Uh, we will uh, speak now, uh, or uh, if you want, Professor Shinyan, to say some more sentences about this amazing book, uh, Book of Causes, so you can add, because we have some more minutes. <laughs> and may I add something to uh, yes, of uh, course. what yeah. Armine said? <laughs> Sorry, I just want to, to add that uh, David the Invincible was not Arme only Armenian author, but uh, he 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 is the one who is often confused with Elias, and he was pupil in uh, Alexandria, so he is really a person who is very important not only for Armenian li literature but for all Neoplatonic. Mm. Uh, literature. 
Yes, and as to uh, Book of Causes, let me just uh, uh, add that if somebody wants to know, I'm speaking about the commentaries prolegomena that are, are exist only in Armenian and not in Greek. I just want to bring two uh, samples. One of them um, is concerning the contemplation on the prophet Ezekiel said by Oregon. And the other one, um, this is considered as an authentic passage from Oregon's commentary, but it seems to be lost. Uh, and the other one is commentary on, on principle on the job by Saint uh, Yeprem, Yeprem the Syrian. So, and uh, one more thing that uh, the uh, this manual has a very interesting and amazing structure because being introduction to the Bible, it consists from uh, three parts. So has a kind of tripartite structure. The first part is prolegomena on the Old Testament. The second part is uh, prolegomena on so-called subtle writings, which is quite other topic and we cannot discuss it here, yeah. unfortunately. And the third part is the prolegomena on the New Testament. And for example, I see in such an arrangement some um, some connection with the Oregon's uh, conception of the totemic sense of the Holy Bible. So this is what I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all very much. Uh, I just want to add here that we are looking forward for the critical edition of the Book of Causes, which will also enrich the general patristic studies. Here we will pause our conversation and continue in the next video. Please stay with us for some more interesting topics.